Could you argue your whole career you've been rebelling against mainstream music? I think I've always found myself naturally out of step, much to my frustration. I would love to have caught the zeitgeist at some point in my career. I never did. Well, you I, are the king of alienating your fans, aren't well, you? Well, <laughs> I, I was getting death threats. If you're not confronting their expectations, then you're probably not moving forward and you're not evolving. So you're a cannibal to your own success? Yeah, in a way, but it's more important to me. I continue to do that in trying to make these big movies for the years. In Absentia didn't sell at the time. It was considered a failure by the label and we got dropped. Music might not even be made by human beings. Drake puts his voice through 100% auto-tune anyway. So it already sounds like Stephen Hawking is on lead vocals. What would you regard as your biggest mistake? I think my biggest mistake was not being born 20 years earlier. I think it would have been much more possible for me to have reached a bigger audience. Today's guest, in my opinion, is the most underrated musical genius. He has produced nearly 20 studio albums, solo and with his bands. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome back to the show the king of progressive rock, Stephen Wilson. If you'd like me to interview more rock god musical geniuses, make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Stephen, are you a musical genius? Genius, what an overused word that <laughs> is, isn't it? I, I, you know, I see genius- I tried to stay straight faced. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't stay straight faced. Um, obviously not. I mean, the thing is for me, a genius would be someone that never produces anything bad, okay? Now, even people that have made classic albums uh, people that have had sustained careers in whatever field you might mention um, have misfires, do things that don't work. Is that not part of being a genius? Well, though? I don't know. The, the ability to fail, you mm. mean, is part of being a genius. Yeah, but a genius wouldn't make a mistake, would they? I don't know. Maybe I'm ah. misunderstanding the term. Yeah. For me, a genius is someone that, that always nails it. And also, I think another thing about genius for me is that's someone that whatever they turn their hand to, they can kind of master it, you know. So genius is someone that's, you know, they can make a movie and it's amazing. They can make an album, it's amazing. They can write a book, it's amazing. I think there's a lot of people that use the word genius when they, they just mean someone is very good at doing something. Right. I'm good at making yeah. records. I know I'm good at making records. Um, I'm not a particularly good musician, but I have a vision and I can hear something in my head and I know how to get the best out of other people who are arguably more talented than me to realise that vision. And I've been doing pretty much the same thing for 30 years, started off making not very good records, got better, and now I think I make pretty consistently good records. But to me, that's far from Mozart maybe a genius. Yeah, yeah. But, but the paradox may exist in what you said about starting by making not very good records. I saw Ed Sheeran, he said, if you want to make good songs, you have to write a lot of shit songs. Yeah. But wouldn't a genius be able to write a great song from the, from the get-go? I don't know, maybe, mm. you know, maybe not. I mean, Mozart could play and write concertos when he was 10, famously. Yeah. Um, that's genius. Someone who's applied themselves to something over a period of time and learned how to do it, got the shit out, got better at it, and ended up being able to do something quite well, or very, let's say very well, is that a genius? That's not genius to me. Gen I, there's, a, there's a very good friend of mine, Robert Fripp from the band King Crimson, and he said to me, very early on after we first met for the first time, we were working on one of his, remixing one of his early classic albums. In fact, it was the first King Crimson album, which is considered by many people to be the birth of what's called progressive rock. When it came out in 1969, no one had ever heard anything like it. And he was talking about this notion of genius, because a lot of people say that band that made that record is genius, or the record is genius. And it is, but I really like Robert's take on it, which is genius is not something, is not a person or a group of people. It's a spirit that temporarily visits somebody and then moves on to someone else. And his whole take on it was in 1969, the spirit of genius temporarily and momentarily yes. visited King Crimson while they were making that record. And then it left them. And it moved on to Pink Floyd, who were making Dark Side of the Moon. And then it left Pink Floyd and moved on to Fleetwood Mac, who were making Rumours. You, you see my point, or his yeah. point, 
is yeah. a genius, is this spirit that's because nobody is infallible. You know, even as I say, even artists that have made extraordinary works of art have also made things that didn't work, that failed, that were so would a genius have done that? But I take your point also that a genius has to also learn from their failures and that's yeah. part of it, yeah. So there's a bit of context to this question. Okay. Because there's an, a live album of Opeth, and I know you know Michael very well. Yeah. Um, and he introduces himself as a musical genius. Yeah, but he would have done so. With, <laughs> he would have done so with tongue firmly in shape. Oh, you think really? Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah. Right. That sounds like classic Michael. Yeah. But then Blackwater Park for me is a, that genius. Yeah, that album. is a, that is a well, genius. Okay, it's a brilliant, brilliant record. A brilliant record and arguably a watershed moment and ironically they made an album called Watershed later on but it's a watershed moment for a particular approach to extreme metal music. But which, which was? Which was metal music that had a depth in the production and a detail in the musicality and production and the layers that actually hadn't really been there before. Um, now I was involved in making that record, mm. so I think what you're talking about is that there's a kind of um, a perfect storm going on there. Yeah. There's a great songwriter who is ambitious to do something a bit more layered and textured, but doesn't necessarily know how to do it himself, but brings me in to help him realize that vision because I'd come from a completely different world of non-metal. I, I was making sort of psychedelic and progressive and art rock and pop and all and bringing that sensibility to what was essentially still at the time a technical death metal band and you see the result that came out of that and Blackwater Park I, I think in a quiet way changed music because no one really had made an extreme metal album with that amount of complexity in terms of the production the sound design and the layering. It was almost like Pink Floyd had made an extreme metal album. Mm. And actually, that hadn't really existed before that. So you can call that album a genius album, but there was a, like I say, there was a perfect storm going on in terms of Michael reaching for something, bringing me in mm. um, to kind of help him realize that. And we came up with something I think really, really special, which has stood the test of time. Um, Michael doesn't think he's a, a musical genius. <laughs> it's just I'd never heard someone introduce themselves as a musical genius ever before. I, I figured there would have been some... He's an extremely humble... Yeah. I mean, he's, he's got that Swedish thing with the, almost the underachieving thing. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, and I think that's partly why those records are so good in a way, because he wasn't approaching them, and I'm talking about those particular records at that time, when he was really doing something new. He wasn't approaching making music in a careerist way. And I remember we talked about this last time I was on your mm. podcast, is that uh, your, your channel is that I, in some ways, and I, Michael I think is the same, we don't think about what we do in terms of um, careers or business or in that kind of, you know, sustaining a kind of business model. And to me, those are the people that push the envelope and push things forward. Because everyone will always tell those people, don't try that, that's never been done before, it won't work. You know, you, you might not be able to sell it. Yeah, absolutely, you might not be able to sell it, but on the other hand, those are the things that push art forward and push, you know. Yeah, I mean, every so nearly every song's like eight to 10 minutes long on that album, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and they're very complicated yeah. and it's not, it's not traditional metal and he's also, Michael is starting to move away from, he's, he's using his clean voice yeah, more, yeah. which actually I can tell it's you. Like almost half and half, isn't it? It's almost yeah. half and half and I can tell you there was a lot of kickback against that from the older fans. Of course there would have been. Yeah. To the point that well, I... Well, you are the king of alienating your fans, aren't well, you? Well, <laughs> I, I was getting death threats. I was getting really? death threats on forums from Opeth fans blaming me. <laughs> Yeah, for taking for, him away from for making Opeth sound gay <laughs> or whatever it was, you know, you, you, you can never <laughs> truly, truly or whatever. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, 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 
that sounded like a compliment to me. But anyway, yeah. obviously they meant it as a negative thing. And I was proud of that. I was proud of that fact that, you know, that these people were getting upset. Because I think, as I said to you last time I was on your, your, your program, is that if you're not upsetting people, at least if you're not upsetting some of your people, or upsetting is the wrong word, if you're not confronting their expectations, then you're probably not moving forward and you're not evolving. And that's always the hardest thing to do. And I think it almost takes people who don't care about their career. Because, mm. yeah, because it's a risk and it could be sabotage yeah. in a lot of ways. And there are plenty of people that have sabotaged their careers by trying to do something. I always think of Terence Trent D'Arby. Do you remember Terence Trent D'Arby? <laughs> yeah, I do. Terence Trent D'Arby, his first album was massive. I mean, he was almost overnight, he was this massive mm. breakthrough star. That first album, The Hard Line of Chords, he was like the new soul sensation. And then for his second album, he decided he was going to be Prince and make this really arty, experimental, no, no concessions to commerciality, no concessions to radio. And he thought the industry would go with him. Interesting, you call them concessions. Well, no concessions to being, you know, perfect for radio or perfect for any of these. But what I mean is interesting that you call them concessions. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Well, they As are. in, I'll, I'll give radio that song and I'll give... Well, it, you, I think you've You've all, got to feed the beast a bit, haven't you? I think more so than ever before, that is the case now. Yeah. Even to the point now where if you want something on radio, you can't even have an intro anymore. You have to be straight in really? with the vocal. In Musica. That was the point I stopped with Slayer because it became very clear to me that they were just going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Mm. And I've never bought a Slayer record since. Yeah, which is sad in some ways. That makes me sad. Whereas I do check out what Metallica do all the time. But they've actually done some quite wacky career moves. Oh yeah. I remember Tom York saying how proud he was of getting Paranoid Android. Because that's what, nearly six minutes, that song? Yeah, but that's and 25 years, that's 26 years ago now. Right, yeah. You wouldn't get that on the No, radio. really? No but he, I think way. he said, you, I think he felt like you wouldn't have done then. Well, it was an anomaly then. Yeah. Now it's an impossibility. Right, <laughs> okay. So, uh, so how long have you got, what? Have you well, got three you, minutes anymore? You've, you've got th about three minutes and you've got to get straight into the vocal. You can't have an intro. I'm talking about commercial radio here. I'm, so, I'm sure there are still rock stations yeah. that will play Opeth and stuff like that. But like the radio, the big BBC radio, so Radio 1s, your Radio 2s, if you want to get a, a track on pop radio, you've got to be straight in with the vocal within the first five seconds. You can't have an intro. You can't have any solos. So the, the days of the great guitar solo, sax solo, whatever it was. You know, remember, remember records having great solos in them. You're the, Slayer would have solo one. Yeah, and solo course. two. Well, Slayer, to be fair, had never got a Radio 1 or Radio <laughs> no, 2 anyway. No. But, Pete, you know, there were, there were Dire Straits. Yeah. You know, a lot of what Dire Straits was about was the great guitar solos. Yeah. Can't have a guitar solo on the radio anymore. People will lose interest. People will switch over. Right. People won't be engaged. But I bet a lot less music to listen to on the radio now, surely. Well, I'm t when I say ra for radio, you can also consider to be part of that the new radio, which is streaming. Right, and the same rules apply. Pretty much, yeah. Getting on, getting on big playlists on, on major streaming platforms, pop, pop playlists that people will listen to, kind of in the way they used to listen to radio. So you put on a radio station, you put on your favourite channel, and you let them decide what you're going to hear. Yeah. Now it's, it's the same. You'll go to Spotify or whatever, or Tidal or Deezer or whatever, and you'll put on a playlist. When I say you, I'm talking very broadly here. I wouldn't do that. But people who just want music as a background to their yoga or their coffee break or their going to sleep yeah. will put on a playlist like music for coffee break or music for yoga. These playlists, in a way, have become the new radio because people are deciding, you know, tastemakers are deciding what goes in those playlists. A tastemaker is... The people who now put people who work for Spotify. Uh, so it's not or it's not algorithms. Amazon also also algorithms. Mm. Yeah, algorithms. In fact, it's probably more algorithms than people now, isn't it? Yeah. So these playlists are being put together by algorithms or by people to essentially not alienate the people that decide to engage with them. So if you put on music for coffee break, 
If there's one song that's annoying or irritating to you or has a guitar solo in it that's losing your, losing your engagement, that could be a problem for the people that are putting the playlist together. So everything gets market researched into oblivion. Music gets market researched into oblivion. The problem is that music should never be about market research. And that's where the whole kind of you know, contradiction comes. Creativity versus business, where does yeah. that? Well, I've got, my, I've got an Andy Warhol quote in here about that in a moment. So we'll, we'll come to that. Okay. So this concession for radio, have you always felt that I've got to give them that? Because I just, I'm fascinated by the word concession. Yeah. It, it, would you like to go, there's no songs in here for radio, there's only songs for me? Not one. I mean, every, well, this is the Terence Trent Derby thing again, isn't it? I mean, that's, he made a record completely for himself, completely fuck you to the record company, the management, the radio stations, and it essentially, it didn't end his career, but it, it ended the momentum that yeah. he had built up um, through his first album. And that's, you know, that's just one example. It's yeah. happened many times over the years with many different artists. Um, the artist. So, so is a gen sorry to interrupt, is a genius, a musical genius, someone who can do that and stay relevant? I think that's part of it. Mm. And this is, if, in a sense, what people like Bowie and the Beatles were able to pull off time and time and time again. And Radiohead, mm. to be fair. Radiohead, OK Computer, um, was followed by Kid A. Now, OK Computer was one of the biggest rock albums ever. Sold, I don't know, 10 million copies. They were at sort of U2 level yeah. of, of mainstream crossover. What did they follow it with? <laughs> fuck you. A, a massive fuck <laughs> it you. It was. The <laughs> but, but they pulled it off. Yeah. Because they stayed, they didn't disappear. They stayed relevant and arg arguably they got even more queued up. They might not have got the sales ever no. again, but I think what they did their fans buy, love them what they it. did buy with, with that album is relevance for the rest of their career. Because now we can do whatever we want. Now we can do whatever we like because people are almost expecting us to do these weird things now. And that's a trick. I think the Beatles were the first people to really pull that off. Yeah. It's a hard, it's a, but it's a hard, it's a, almost like a magic act yeah. to be able to pull that off and still manage to have the attention of the world. Mm. And I think it's harder now. It was hard in the 60s, it was hard in the 70s, it was hard in the 80s, but now it's almost impossible because people have so many things. This is what, you know, you see film, filmmakers like Christopher Nolan, he's, some, he's one of the rare people that still pulls off this trick. He makes these weird three-hour arty films about Oppenheimer mm. and still has massive box office. How do you do that? Yeah. How do you do that? He's one of the only people that can do that. Yeah. Did you watch the Barbie film? I Harry seen wanted it. me to ask you about this. I haven't seen it yet. What's your no. verdict? I haven't seen it. No. But Harry wanted me to... Um, average, but a lot of people have lost their minds over it. Right. Not. You're not the first person to say that to me. The f you're not the first person, you're not, I've heard a lot of people say it's amazing and then I've heard increasingly over the last week or so, it's really not that good and they, I don't understand why people are losing their mind over it. But that's, that's the thing about hype, creating marketing hype, isn't it? Yeah, and what do you think about this sort of movement, this anti, I mean, is that an anti-male movement? Is there some anti? It's perceived to be quite a woke film, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds, it, it sounds like it's, it's a perfect opportunity to address sexual politics, isn't it? Making a Barbie film, you know, <laughs> the, the ultimate sort of sexist reactionary figure yeah. to make a kind of woke film about that. It's, it's almost like a no-brainer, isn't mm. it? Yeah. Because you m said earlier, this is yeah. really interesting me, I found it hilarious and I'm, 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 might have some kickback for this, but... When I was at school, if you did a somewhat metrosexual act, you would be called gay. And yeah. you, you said people were, you know, you made Blackwater Park gay. Well, that was and can you, <laughs> you, were you going to email me to take that bit out? I mean, do you no, feel no, like... No, no, I'm not because, I mean, I think, I think the, it's clear from my inference that I think that's extremely reactionary and, and, and 
and, uh, and problematic. But let's just say this is 23 years ago and the metal community at the time <laughs> were not the most progressive in terms of their thinking. Yeah. Um, there was still, even then, a lot of macho machismo about the world of metal. Metal. It's 23 years ago. Mm. Um, and I think metal, even at that time, was still perceived to be very much a testosterone-driven form of music. Mm. Maybe still is, compared to a lot of kinds of music anyway, but perhaps less so now. It, it, listen, it was reactionary and, and pretty unpleasant even then. Um, but things have changed a lot for the good, you know, for the better now. But yes, I think there's always a, there's always a risk when the pendulum swings too much in the opposite direction. So you get tokenism and wokeism mm. in, in things like that. But let's be honest, 99% of the, of the whole woke phenomenon is a, is a fantastic thing that's doing a lot of good. Um, I haven't seen the movie yet, I can't, can't comment on it. Mm. How does this make you feel, this conversation on how the world's changing? It's about songs now, it's not about albums. It's about 30 seconds of a song or 15 seconds on TikTok rather than a whole song. Am I happy about this? Obviously not. If you join Rob.team right now, you can claim not one, but two special bonuses. Number one is my eight week money mastermind university. What they should be teaching you in schools about money, but are not. And I've got two special tickets to the Money Maker Summit. The best business opportunities for recurring and passive income. Go right now to Rob.team, R-O-B.T-E-A-M for this special offer. Could you argue your whole career um, you've been rebelling against mainstream music? But not, but not in a kind of self-conscious way. I think I've always found myself naturally out of step with whatever has been going on, much to my frustration most of the time. Um, I would love to have been, I would love to have caught the zeitgeist at some point in my career. I never did. I never did. And I was so in love with the idea, still am, so in love with the idea of artistic integrity and doing what an artist should do, which is not anything that where you, that word concessions, that it was more important to me to continue to do what I was doing, no matter how out of step that was and continues to be. I mean, listen, I'm still making albums that are musical journeys that you're supposed to engage with from beginning to end, in the dark preferably, concentrating on this massive conceit unfolding to you like a movie. And how many people engage with pop music like that in, in 2023? Hardly any people engage with pop music in that way. But it's more important to me that because I love that so much, that I continue to do that um, and continue to satisfy myself in trying to make these big movies for the years, cinematic, the cinematic equivalent of music, in an age when realistically the rest of the industry is moving further and further and further away from, from that way of engage with, engaging with music. And how does that um, tension play out in you in terms of, on the one hand, you like, would have liked to have caught the zeitgeist, but you're clearly doing something which is against the natural trajectory of where music is going. Plus, you, I told you this the last time I interviewed you, when you Google God of progressive rock, etc., you still come up top, yet you're not really making well, your latest album, you even said when you... Can I just say, thank you for the um, invite. Pleasure. Where we came along and listened yeah. to the, your latest album in... What was the technical term? Uh, spatial audio. Yeah, spatial, spatial audio. audio. Yeah, yeah. You, when you came out and introed, you said this is a non-genre based music. Right. Right. So I'm really fascinated with that, you, you, you know... You come up as the god king of progressive rock and yeah, yeah, but I think in the same way, in the same way that 
David Bowie, and listen, I'm not comparing myself to David Bowie. I always hate invoking Bowie because people think, oh, he thinks he's David Bowie <laughs> or he's in the same league as Bowie. Of course I don't. But in the same way that if you Google David Bowie, you'll still find a, le- a lot of references to him as the king of glam. Right. He, so in yeah. some, it, for many people, he is, he is like frozen in amber as Ziggy Stardust. Mm. And yet if you look at Bowie's career, it's a constant sense of reinvention from glam to soul boy with young Americans to new wave icon with heroes and low and ashes to ashes to pop sensation with let's dance to reinventing himself as the godfather of art pop you know all of these things are all Bowie from folk troubadour of his early years you know and yet if you google him you'll probably find a lot of references to him as the king of glam, glam rock. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing now, maybe I'm wrong about that, but I suspect there'll still be a lot of, a lot of the images will be him of, as, as Ziggy with the orange hair and the flash down. His, and that's only a tiny little part. And maybe that was frustrating to him too. Um, yes, it's frustrating, but at the same time, it's great to be the god of anything. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm very flattered if, if some people think of me as, you know, having reached the pinnacle of anything. Um, yes, I will argue till I'm blue in the face about the fact that I've done a lot more than, than that would suggest. And, and the new album, as, you, as I said in this presentation, as you, as you referred to, I made this point of saying the most important thing for me with this album was to make an album that was somehow outside of any notion of genre. And to me, that's the biggest problem with most modern music, is that you can tell within 10 seconds what what it is. Uh, Why is that a problem? That's a very good question. Why is that a problem? Maybe it isn't. It's just a problem to me. <laughs> because I've always responded, I think, the best to artists that somehow created their own musical universe, which had nothing to do with notions of fitting into an existing set of parameters. I mean, this is what your, your whole program is about, isn't mm, it? Yeah. Um, most music takes a set of parameters and creates something within those parameters, whether it's death metal, hip hop, country, whatever it is, it basically takes a blueprint and adheres to that blueprint. What's great is when you do get artists like the Beatles in the 60s, like Radiohead in the 90s, like Bowie in the 70s, like Kate Bush and Peter Gable in the 80s, there are many other artists that would fit into this category too, that created their own musical universe by constantly wrong-footing people about actually what they were. How, could, how do you describe what kind of music the Beatles made? It's Beatles music. How can you describe what music Kate Bush makes made? It's Kate Bush music. Radiohead. It's kind of it's alternative indie, but it's not really, because it's also electronic. Yeah, not anymore. It's, mm. it's just Radiohead. It's Tom and Johnny and Radiohead, and this is, this is we recognise the sound when we hear it, but what genre is that? I don't know. I love it. I love the fact that I can't say. I love the fact that I can't say what kind of movie does Christopher Nolan make. He makes movies in different genres. Every movie is like in a different genre, mm. you know. And actually, that's interesting because talking about the movie world, it's much more accepted, I think, to be doing that in the world of cinema than it is in the world of music. If you think of great directors, they'll quite often move from making a horror movie to a thriller to a rom-com, to a period drama, to a historical drama, and that's okay. It's accepted to do that if you're a director. Imagine doing that if you're a musician. Imagine making a hip-hop album, then a death metal album, then a country and western album. I mean... Have you been trying to do this without obviously (laughs) doing this? No, I haven't. I mean, not not to that extreme, and actually... Obviously, because if you had your solo career in as well as Porcupine Tree, you've got a good variety. I've got a good variety, yeah. I've got a good variety. I think what's, I think the point, the answer to my own question is, if you have a strong enough personality, actually, 
anything you do just ends up being you anyway. Mm. So actually, it doesn't matter if Kubrick or Scorsese or Christopher Nolan make a period drama. There's something about it that still just looks like a Kubrick, Scorsese or yeah. Christopher Nolan movie. And I think it's also true of musicians that if you have a strong enough personality, it just sounds like you anyway. And so on this album, The Harmony Codex, this new record, which I say is outside of genre, at least I like to think of it outside of genre, it's got all these different styles on it, from ambient to progressive to jazz to pop to electronic to rock. But actually, the, the result, when you hear the end result, and I know this because people have said to me, that they've heard it, what they actually hear really is, oh, it's a Stephen Wilson record. Mm. And to me, that's the ultimate aim really, is to be able to do anything and for it to sound like I've created my own, my own little universe, such that people will always recognise my style regardless of having to adhere to any set of parameters or any generic tropes. Mm. And most music is made within a set of generic tropes. Mm. And I, I, sometimes I wonder what the appeal is um, to form another death metal group. And there are kids out there now, to this, you know, even today in 2023, there are kids out there forming bands that sound like Slayer or Metallica. And I'm thinking, what's the appeal? of doing something that's been a path that's so well trodden by thousands, tens of thousands of bands before you. Um, Is that not maybe the start of them finding out who they are? I'd like to think so. I'd like to think because so, yes. Because surely we all yeah. start with musical influences. Yeah, true. I think, yeah, I mean, I've said this, that you start your career by wearing your influences on your sleeve. Mm. Most people do. Mm. And then if you... And then hopefully you find your own identity along the way. Right, you transcend. Yeah. You transcend your influences. I hope so. I would like to think some of these very generic bands will, will eventually, two, three, four albums down the line, will hit on some, something that makes them unique. But it's harder these days to even get to two, three, four albums down the line. Yeah. It's a very short turnaround of bands. Um, but yes, I take your point, yeah. Mm. But, but it's almost like, I think about this a lot. I think one of the ways, obviously, to be original is to find the thing that hasn't been done before. But those things are running out mm. because almost every hybrid, I mean, certainly in musical terms, Finding something that hasn't been done before is about finding two things that have never been crossed before, right. or three things yeah. that have never been crossed before, and crossing them together. And you can do that, but that in itself becomes a bit of a dead end, because then everyone else can go out and imitate that, and you have to find something that will transcend that and actually... So I think we're back to what I'm talking about before, which is at the end of the day, you have to have a str strong personality that will transcend the approach. Do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So you can analyze Radiohead and you can analyze Kate Bush and you can analyze David Bowie and you can say, oh, they were, you know, they were the first band to mix, like Radiohead, the first band really, to, the first indie guitar band to embrace electronic music in a big way. And they did that. And then almost overnight, everyone copied them. Everyone. Mm copied Radiohead. Mm. The whole of the first 10 years of the 2000s were people trying to fuse indie music and electronic music, mm. but no one did it as well as Radiohead. Yeah. And it's very yeah. interesting to me that that's because it wasn't just about the idea, it was also about the personality and the strength right. of the songwriting. At the same time, let me ask you this. Um, do you respect a band like Slayer who churn out the same album every year for the last 20? It's not a matter of whether I respect them, because I do. Any band that made Rain in Blood are, are deserved of my eternal respect. <laughs> yeah. But there is a sense... Because Rammstein have done that, haven't they? They have. Brilliantly. To be fair, that is what most musical acts do. They find a formula and they do tend... Right. And there's nothing wrong with that. ACDC... It's the opposite the, of progressive, isn't it? It's the ways. opposite of yeah. progressive, but who said, prog who said you had to progress? Well, I, I did, but I'm, coming, <laughs> but I'm coming from a very, very personal perspective, which yeah. is based on the kind of artists that I grew up feeling were the most magical of all, were the ones that reinvented and progressed. Nobody said, there's no reason why you should have to. ACDC have never made a record that sounded anything like 
anything other than like the, the original ACDC blueprint. Mm. It's an amazing sound. They've been doing it for 50 years. Yeah. You know what? And they still, their audience is still as passionate and dedicated as ever. And they will always have my respect for that. Mm. And Slayer is kind of a little bit like that. And then you have the other side of the coin, whereas a band like Metallica have tried, have tried to reinvent themselves. Mm. And the metal community can be one of the most conservative and reactionary you could possibly imagine. So when Metallica made their album with Lou Reed, the, the kickback on that was brutal. Brutal. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of that, why can't they just keep, keep making Master of Puppets over and over again? Still, they still have that to this day. Yeah. And that's a shame. That is a shame. Let me ask you this. Let me throw the question back at you. You really like that band. I can see why. It's a very original sound. Mm. This is an album they've made, right? This yeah. is a track off a new album. Yeah. At what point would you stop listening if the next album they made was essentially the same formula and the one after that was essentially the same formula and the one after that was the same? At what point yeah. would you, or would you not? Would you always maintain an allegiance to them? because you love that one album that you first fell in love with? I, I find that probably the most difficult question in music to answer. Do you still buy Slayer albums? Um, I would definitely still buy a Slayer album, okay. hoping it's as close as possible to Seasons in the Abyss or... So in a way, um, you are that person who... Uh, I, this, I said paradox. <laughs> yeah. when, are you, yeah. when are you gonna do yeah. it in absentia again? Well, it, never. It, no, no. I know, I know that about because you. Because I've done it. Yeah. Because I've done it. And why would but I do it again? This is the challenge, isn't it? Because I was going to ask you, let me throw it back at you, just to take the heat off me a little bit. But um, how do you maintain that fan base? I will always be... I don't. Well, yeah. I don't. I lose fans all so the time. You, yeah. And I gain new ones. So you're a cannibal to your own success. Yeah, in a way. I am... I'm always confronting and disappointing my fans at the same time as some of them are uh, pleasantly surprised, others are very disappointed and drift away, and at the same time as new fans come on board that would never have been interested in, in absentia, but they like what I'm doing now. Mm. They don't like metal, they don't like guitar. So there's a whole element of my audience now that would never listen to the more metal stuff that I've done in the past because they, they don't like that kind of music. Yeah. So there is an element of constantly regenerating the audience. Mm. The problem of that is it never really builds. The audience kind of maintains an equilibrium. So it's one in, one out, like the old nightclubs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's almost like being in a, sh you know, in a boat, like two or three people jump out and, to, 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 and you, you maintain yeah. that equilibrium. So you just about manage to keep yourself afloat because your audience is still there, just about. It's the same number of people, but they're not the same yeah. people. And I think that is... But isn't your core fan base someone who appreciates progression, being that you're in a progressive genre? I think more, probably more so than the audience of Slayer and ACDC, yes. Yeah. They've come to expect a little bit more, but there are still plenty of people that would love me to make... Still waiting for an adventure. Yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> a, or another raven that refused to sing, yes. uh, or something like that. There's plenty of people like that too. Um, we live in hope. It's, it's in, sorry to jump in, it's interesting being a music fan because on the one hand, I'm really excited about where you're going to go and I will always follow you on that journey. I'll always buy a Radiohead album. I always will. I'll always buy your solo or porcupine tree. So I'll go with you on that journey. But there's always a little part of my soul that's just hoping that you'll pay homage to what we love about you the most. Here's, here's two, I've got two things to say about that. Firstly, I think as a fan, and I'm like this too, the door that you first walk through into an artist's world, the one that really opens up and blows your mind, will always be a special, that room that you walk into will always be a special space for you. And actually, there is an element that the artist is always doomed to never be able to match up to that in your, 
in your ears mm. or your eyes. Mm. Because there's something magical about the, the, when, the moment you fall in love with your wife or, or the first time. There's mm. something special about that. There's a magic that the, the, the first album that made you fall in love with an artist will always hold a unique position. And the artist is doomed never to be able to live up to that with you. Yes. The second thing is never thought of it like the that. second thing is you're absolutely right. There's a there's a complete paradox here, but which I suffer from myself with artists. That I'm all, part of me is always hoping to recapture that moment, and it's always like why why can't they make a record like that one that they made 20 years ago that made me fall in love with them in the first place again? But at the same time, wanting the artists that I follow to surprise me and to progress. So there is a, there is a sort of contradiction there always. Mm. And I think part of it, part of being a fan is holding those two contradictory things in, in some kind of balance. There are things that you love about an artist that you want, you want to go back to that comfortable space every time with them. Mm. But at the same time, what's the point of just buying the same record over and over again every two years? When, when do you stop? Well, you're saying you don't, but with Slayer. But um, I mean, I, I bought Rain in Blood when I was a kid. It blew my mind. I bought Seasons in the Abyss. I really like that too. I think, I think there was a point Diabol Di Diabolos in Musica that was the point I stopped with Slayer because it became very clear to me that they were just going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again mm. and I've never bought a Slayer record since yeah which is sad in some ways that makes me sad whereas I do check out what Metallica do all the time because Metallica have done some quite regardless of what you think about how successful or not they pulled off the transition the transition they've actually done some quite wacky career moves and incurred the wrath of their fan base. But that's made me always check out what Metallica will do, because I wonder what they've done now. Um, I've never checked out what Slayer have done since, because I think in my mind I filed it away as, they're just, just going to keep doing the same thing now. There's no, ne there's no need. There's no need for me to listen to what they do now. Whereas with Metallica, I still feel like I need to check out what they've done. Yeah. And it will always be that way with Radiohead. Yeah. Yeah. Two. So it's, but you're right that there's this kind of inherent contradiction is, well, what's the point of progressing if I just don't like where they've progressed to? Yeah. That's the bit, you know, that, that never makes sense really. Yeah. It must be very difficult being an, an artist and trying to take your fan base with you, keeping them interested in where they found you and taking them on a journey to where you're going. Yeah. Do you ever think about that? All the time. Mm. Because I don't, what, regardless what people say and what think, uh, think about me, I, I'm not going out of my way to upset my fans. I'm really not. You're, you're giving it a good go. I, but I'm, re <laughs> I'm really not trying. I want them to like it. Of course I do. <laughs> of course I want them to like yeah. it. But at the same time, I have to try, stay true to myself and I have to feel like there's a point to me making another record. Mm. And to just make a facsimile of something I've already done holds no interest to me. And I can't quite understand why it would hold any interest in my fans either. Mm. But of course it does. The rational part of me understands exactly why it does. Mm. To me, I think it all comes back, again, it all comes back to the Beatles. The Beatles are, and always will be, the touchstone by which every, all other pop music is measured. At least certainly if you come from the tradition of rock music, the Beatles are the standard by which all other rock music is measured. And when you look at the transitions the Beatles went through in an incredibly short period of time, about half the time it, it takes Tool to make one record. <laughs> the Beatles formed, changed the world, and I, I, I don't say that lightly, they changed the world because their music impacted everything. Youth culture was affected and changed by the Beatles. Formed and broke up and made 10 records and what, 20 singles. Look at the progression. Look at how many times they surprised their fans. Look at the progression from She Loves You, Yeah, 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 to I Am The Warrus. Five years. It's phenomenal. 
and I'm not the world's biggest Beatles fan, I was always Pink Floyd rather than Beatles, but I will always have incredible respect and consider them the standard by which everything else is to be measured, if only because of that sense of progression. And yet, what happened to pop music in the wake of the Beatles, really, was largely it became about finding a formula and repeating it over and over and over and over again. And that is the norm. Slayer is not the, is not the anomaly, they are the norm. Mm. The anomalies are the Metallicas that actually try and go and do these little weird kind of projects that upset their fans. They are the anomaly. Um, and yet the Beatles... The Maybe that's what makes them more special to their fans then, that not everyone is... Right. And I think this is, yeah. what, I was, this is what I was going to come around to eventually. I'm sorry, I, I, I'm very long-winded in these things. This is what I was going to come around to eventually. I think that if you do those things, ultimately you do get grudging respect. Mm. And ultimately I think it's why Metallica are quote-unquote more important as a band historically than Slayer. Even though Raining Blood, Master of Puppets, to me, they're the two, they're the two foundations mm. on which almost all contemporary metal has come out of, Metallica will always be seen as the more important band culturally. I'm talking about on a wider scale mm. because... I mean, they are a bit softer in their tone, aren't they? The, you know, their they sound made, is not as yeah, extreme. They made a pop record. Yeah. But the Black Album is a pop record. Yes. It is. It's a pop record in, within the musical vocabulary of metal, but it is a pop record. Mm. Something Slayer didn't and probably couldn't, which is no disrespect to them. No, maybe not wanted to. And maybe not yeah. wanted to. And, and then Metallica went off and made an album in an orchestra, and then they made an album with Lou Reed, and then they sort of did their proto-grunge records, Load that, and Reload. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, mm, like yeah, I say, yeah. got a lot of kickback. But I think what's happened is they've come out the other end with this kind of grudging respect that they are almost the radio head of metal. Yes. They will try these things. Yeah. And they have now got our respect. And yes, they've gone back to making more traditional Metallica music, but they've gone this sort of circuitous route to, in doing so, and they've earned our respect. Mm. I'm talking our in a sort of, you know, very broad... I'm, I'm just... So, yeah. in a way, I think... There's a sense that disappointing your fans, confronting your expectations of your fans, does ultimately earn you a kind of respect that you wouldn't otherwise have. And you can use that to be a little bit more flexible in, in what you do. Mm. Do you think that requires a longevity of vision in, your, in building up your discography? I think it takes time, yeah. Because, you know, if, yeah. it, if you churn out 10 albums and you go on a, this S-shaped journey, you look back and you go, oh, yeah, those three or four were great and that was a bit off the beaten track. You've got to have enough to look back on, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's, a very, there's another very interesting, I'm invoking Robert Fripp again, very interesting Robert Fripp quote about the same album. He said that when, after they made that album, he knew that everything the band, and the band basically split up, all of the original members broke up. He said he knew that he, he basically became the, the, he became King Crimson at that point and he put together a new lineup of the band. And he said he knew that everything they were gonna do for the next two or three years would be wrong, but they had to do it in order to come out the other end. Right, yeah. And I think that's a really fascinating quote because they ended up making two or three records that didn't gel, that didn't quite, you know, gel or didn't quite resonate with the fan base but then they arrived at a point where suddenly they were making great King Crimson music again that didn't sound like what they'd done originally but people were embracing it again and that always stuck with me too that sometimes you have to like you're right you have to go on this journey this almost estuary, where you look back and you say well that was a failure but I understand why I had to do it I understand why I had to make that record. Mm. Artistically, I had to make that record in order to be, on, to be able to move on and make the next record, which is kind of informed by or learned by. Mistakes is probably the wrong word because obviously when you made the record, you believed in it. And I've, I've made records that I look back on now and I can see why they didn't resonate so well with the fan base. 
Um, Have you got an example? The last album I made, The Future Bites, was an, ele- was an electronic pop record. Mm. And it came out during COVID. It's a tough sell. Yeah. It's a tough sell for my audience. But I also know that I couldn't have made the Harmony Codex if I hadn't made Future Bites. Not that the Harmony Codex is an electronic pop record, far from it. It's a big conceptual journey. But there are elements that are informed by the fact. And also there's a sense that every, every album is a reaction to the previous album. So I needed to make that electronic pop record so that on the next record I can say, okay, I've done that. Now I'm going to make a, I've made this very streamlined, direct electronic pop record. Now I want to make a big, epic, conceptual rock record again. Mm. So it's the kicking again, you know, almost like reaction to what you did on the last record. So there's a sense of needing to take these steps in order to arrive at your destination. Mm. Do you think you might end up full circle back at rock? It's possible. Can you just, You're still just, dreaming you just, at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> can you just tease me enough to give me the... I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Right, you know, right now, the... The kind of musical vocabulary you're talking about, the, the metal guitars and the drums, is not hugely interesting to me, but that doesn't mean that it might not be again in five years. Mm. Um, I, you know, I've been on a journey through my whole career. I started off in 1992 as a professional musician making um, pop music with a band called No Man and this weird kind of bedroom psychedelic music with Porcupine Tree. And then around the time I worked with Opeth, I discovered the whole world of metal and I started to incorporate that into Porcupine Tree and In Absentia was kind of the peak of that fusion um, of styles. And since then, I feel like I exhausted that that avenue. Um, in terms of what can I do with that musical vocabulary that I haven't done already, answer, not much. So, okay, so let's do something else now. Mm. So this brings us full circle back to the conversation about, but the fans actually sometimes want you to, even if it's a pale copy of what they love, they would rather you do that than something different. Those are the people that I have to ignore with no disrespect to them, that I have to ignore those people. I have to ignore you. <laughs> because I think if I tried to make In Absentia, a follow-up to In Absentia, you would be disappointed with it anyway. I might not, though. I think you would. I have a chance to now influence my... No, you my don't. Dude. You really no, don't. No, just, you really don't, because no. I'm not... I wouldn't no, do I'm, that's a very flippant remark. I, but I think... You, you wouldn't make a shit version of a... You're a creative musician. You, you would, you, that would just wouldn't happen where you would make an imi- a, a crap imitation of... A... I wouldn't make a crap imitation, but I think this comes back to my point earlier, that I would, ne- you, I would never be able to recapture for you that moment when you walked through that door and discovered In Absentia. I will never be able to give you that feeling again. The same way that people that like Slayer will never get the feeling that they first the first got when they, they fell in love with Rain in Blood or heard it for the first time. You cannot. I mean, I remember the first time I heard that record. I could not believe it. It was almost transcendent. Mm. No one has ever been able to recapture that feeling, including Slayer. <laughs> yeah, you've been trying for 20 years. Oh, who have been uh. trying. And not only them, thousands of other bands as well have imitated that. There's blueprint. like a wave of sadness that's just come over me in this moment but embrace it as a good thing yeah i think i think i can i think i can i've just never been able to have this discussion with anyone who i'm so interested in their music um because you don't normally get to i mean this is one of the best parts of my job right um this is not a normal conversation is it Uh, you know most people who are into their Mute their bands don't get to have their exactly. this conversation. Exactly. I mean, thinking this deeply about music is actually quite an unfashionable thing to do these days. It is because music is, is music has, yeah. improved, has moved increasingly to being to being very much a peripheral thing in most people. People still love music. Don't get me wrong, mm. but it's much more of a peripheral thing in their life. 
Right. It isn't when I was growing up, and maybe when you were growing up, completely... Re records, actually. Yeah. L listening to music in the dark, or yeah. being depressed at 15 and the listening to music. Yeah, the to, way you dress. Yeah, when I got my first Pantera t-shirt. Exactly. The, the, the image that that portrays, Everything. yeah. Affected every aspect of your life. Your relationship with your parents was affected by the music that you... you Fell in love with, yeah, or not, <laughs> or not. But well, it was, yeah, yeah. whatever, rebellion right. or yeah. whatever, whatever. Do kids rebel against their parents with music now? No, because their parents listen to much more radical music than their kids listen That's to. That's true, yeah. So how do you rebel against your parents when they were listening to Slayer and Metallica? <laughs> yeah. You can't. No. Or, or you know, or, or the Exploited or whatever it was. So, or even the Beatles, and you know, th this is music that was really radical at the time and, and there isn't really, I don't think that opportunity exists for young people now to rebel with music. Music isn't about rebellion anymore. Um, so in that sense, so coming back to my original point, all, all musicians I think are doomed to disappoint their fans when they try to give them again that feeling that they first got when they heard a record like Rain in Blood for the first time. Um, so yes, that's sad, but it's also amazing. Mm. Because yeah, I, think, I think life is, very often life is about these, you know, one of the things I've said about the Harmony Codex, which, um, you know, a lot of the concept of the record relates to this idea that life is about the journey, it's not about the arrival. It's about recognizing these incredible moments that may not have even seemed that significant at the time, but recognizing that life is about a series of moments that are incredibly special. And you never really, you never really get to, I mean, like if I think about this in musical terms, every album I've ever made is a failure because it was never quite the album I imagined in my mind. But it's okay, because the next one might be. And that keeps me going forward. But of course, the next record is also a failure. And the one after that is also a failure. And the point I'm making is I'll never actually, I'll never actually create the album I heard in my... And, you know, Paul McCartney will say the same about the Beatles and even, you know... I mean, is that a failure? Is that part of the creative process? I think it is part of the creative process. And of course, they're not failures, really. They're incredible records. But when I use the word failure, what I mean is they never quite turn out the way the artist intended. Francis Bacon always used to say that about his paintings, and he, he mm. destroyed a lot of paintings. Um, they never quite lived up to what he imagined they would be before he started, or when he was just starting. They never quite fulfilled the promise or the thing that he saw in his head. Mm. So to him, they were all failures. Yeah. Francis Bacon saying his paintings are failed. And I think there's a sense that the artist is always doomed to fail to an extent too. Unless he has an incredible amount of hubris and he thinks everything he does is genius. Yeah. Like Michael Ackerfeld. <laughs> <laughs> Except he really doesn't. Um, so I think if the artist is always doomed to fail, then I think there's a sense that the, the, the listener is all also doomed to never get that feeling again. But we keep the fantasy alive. And partly that's what, what keeps the musician and the fan going forward with each other. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'd never thought of it like that. I imagine, because yeah. like, I'm personally not as keen where Radiohead went in their last album, but I imagine they picked up quite a new fan base from that album. And actually, for me, a sign of a good band or musician, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, is a few listens and then songs grow on you. Yeah, absolutely. So some of yeah. your albums, really, like especially a lot of your songs are constructed whereby the, the first minute and a half is very different to the second minute mm. and a half. And you catch these melodies and these riffs at the end of a song, mm. hi almost hidden in an album. Mm. And, and I, I think that's mu music that stays with you the longest is sometimes music that was hardest for you to enjoy. I think there's an element of that. Like there's earn, sorry, there's yeah. like earning into a song. If it's easy to enjoy it straight away, maybe it doesn't last long. 
but if it took some earning in, for me, Blackwater Park took me a load of goes to get into that song, the last song on Blackwater Park album. And I think I really earned into enjoying that song because mm. it took so many goes. Yeah, and I've always said that all my favourite albums I didn't like the first time I heard them. Mm. No, not all, but many of my favourite albums, the albums I would take to a desert island if I could, are albums that the first time I heard were like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> I do not like... Yeah, absolutely. What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? Do but, you aim for that sometimes? Or what yeah, the fuck is that? Yeah. yeah. But actually, there was enough... <laughs> There was enough about it that made me curious to go back and listen a second time. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I can see maybe here. And then a third, fourth, and you're right, fifth, sixth yeah. time, maybe then it clicks, maybe the tenth time it clicks. Yeah. But this is why music like that is so out of step with 2023. Because there's no commercialization, you can't get it out there. Well, it's not only that, I think t in terms of generally people's, people's attention span right, is yeah. shorter, including my own, I'm not, yeah. I'm not excluding myself. People have so much more in their lives. There's a proliferation of music. There's a proliferation of TV. There's a proliferation of movies. They're so, so distracted all the time exactly. on social media. Social media, yeah. yeah. So how do you get someone to listen to something the second time when they didn't even like it the first time? Why should they? There's 120,000 songs being added to Spotify every day. Why should people go back and listen to something they didn't even like? Go back and listen to it a second time. Why should I? There's a million other things I can go and listen to. And so that's the difference between a record that you paid money for that you felt invested in, yeah, I paid money for this bloody record, I'm definitely gonna to listen to it again. Yeah. Um, there's a difference, and that's part, of the, that's part of the issue with music now, is it's so easy to move on to the next thing if it doesn't connect with you instantly, within 30 seconds. I mean, one of the things record companies and marketing people say to you, and I'm sure you have this thing in your business enterprises too, is you've gotta count on having people's attention online for about 30 seconds. So if you're making a video or a song, imagine that getting into your mindset. Oh, I've got to get people engaged in 30 seconds. Otherwise, well, we've got to do it in five seconds, haven't we? Five seconds. Have you, you, hopefully, are you a musical genius, achieved that? I mean, it's a, it's a, di it's a direct question, but that is, the, that is that's us. That's why you went off with that. That's why you led off yeah, with that question. Yeah, it is. I think I can get away with it with a conversation with you because our last one went down so well and I think we can hold attention more. But if I'd have said, Stephen, how are you? How, how have you been since the last interview? Retention, wow. Interesting. Yeah, and that sucks. In, in a way, it makes me a better interviewer because hopefully you felt that's a, I'm not pissing around and we're getting straight into it. There's nothing wrong with wanting to grab people's attention. Absolutely not. And, but, but then at the same time, think of all the classic music over the years. And there are many pieces of music like I think, always think of Shine On Your Crazy Diamond by Pink Floyd, which starts off with a minute fading in of just a chord. Before you hear anybody, anything else. Shine On Your Crazy Diamond, one of the most iconic classic rock tracks of all time. Yeah. A minute of a, fa a chord fading in. <laughs> How are you going to get that across to the, <laughs> How are you gonna the, sell the that? kids of today? How are you going to sell yeah, that Well, shit? the answer is you're not. The answer is you're not. You can't. You can't sell that anymore. Um, luckily, that track is well established as part of the classic rock canon, mm. so it kind of sells itself now. But if you came out with that as a new song and you had to make a video for that, the first minute is a chord fading in. <laughs> Imagine what the social media and marketing specialists would say to you that when you came in with that. And I have these discussions all the time. And I understand the problems. And I will do my best to kind of circumnavigate these problems and sell myself without compromising. Well, that's not true. I do compromise. I have to, but I compromise within parameters that I feel comfortable with. I'm not going to edit my song down to a three minute song if it's a 12 minute song. In fact, one of the songs we're releasing from the new record up front is an 11 minute piece of music called Impossible Tightrope. And we've made an 11 minute video and there's no edits in it. And I'm saying, fuck it. Let's just release it like that. Wow, is that, can we get, is that out now? No, it's gonna be the second, the second s single from the album. The first single has been like a four minute song. The second single, which is coming out literally within three days of the second, is, is a 11 minute, predominantly instrumental piece with a full length video. And I'm like, fuck it, let's, you know, let's not underestimate people's intelligence. Let's not, excuse me, let's not underestimate people's attention spans. And, uh, you know, it could be a complete failed experiment. It could be my Terence Trent Derby 
<laughs> sophomore album experience. But, you know, part of me thinks there's got to be people out there that still want to engage with music on a deeper level. Oh, well, I know there are. I know mm. there are people out there. Um, you can drive yourself crazy thinking about all these things. Yeah. Drive yourself crazy. I mean, as if it's not difficult enough to be a creative thinker mm. and have all these paradoxes, but you add to it commercialization, which we'll talk about in a moment, and then, yeah, grabbing people's attention. I imagine that's, yeah. And I mean, some might say first world problems. Well, they are first world problems. Yeah. I mean, I'm lucky, to talk about first world problems, I'm lucky in the sense I don't have to worry about monetizing my career anymore. Is that because you've been good with money in the past? Or? I've been good with money and I've been very fortunate. I came, I started in the music industry in the early 90s when it was still possible to, to create, uh, to create a, a solid fan base, um, to create a back catalogue over a period of time which ticks over very nicely. Mm. I've been very fortunate to get into the world of remixing classic albums for the, you know, Atmos and whatever it is. Right. And I've had a very good career. Without being a mainstream mm. figure, I've been very fortunate to have a very successful career. Not very, but so let's just say sustaining career. Um, so if you didn't want to write any more music, I'm fine. you're okay. I'm fine. Yeah. And I don't underestimate, under, I don't underestimate how privileged I am to be able to say that. Yeah. The bottom line is... You have dedicated three decades of your life to that though. I've dedicated three decades and I've, and I've dedicated and I have a back catalogue which thank God continues to do okay for me. Mm. There are some artists out there that, that have been making music for three decades and their back catalogue has literally stopped selling. No one's interested in it anymore. Porcupine Tree catalogue, my solo catalogue, seems to be sustaining. Is that the benefit of making lots of different type of... And, oh. not, comprom and not having any sense of compromise. So, yeah. when somebody discovers your musical world, I think they, they kind of acknowledge that they can't get what you do from anyone else. There's something about what Stephen Wilson does I can only get by listening to Stephen Wilson records. I understand here there's something a bit unique and a bit bloody minded that is shot through all of this music that he makes. And I can only get that from listening to his music. So I'll keep coming back to it. And the, the albums tick over. In Absentia, you, I mean, you mentioned In Absentia. In Absentia didn't, I don't remember, if, I can't remember if we talked about this at the time. In Absentia didn't sell at the time. Didn't sell. It was considered a failure by the label and we got dropped one album later. Oh, right. But I tell you I what, it keeps selling every year that album yeah. sells, sells 10, 15,000 units. Right. Every year. Streaming figures are sustaining. Yeah. We made the album 20 years ago and it's still, well, actually, arguably, it's getting more attention now than it was at the time we released it. Mm. Anyway, the point I'm making is that I have a back catalogue that ticks over very nice for, nicely for me, which I'm very lucky to be in that situation. Well, not lucky, I'm privileged to be in that situation. So when I make records now, I don't have to care about, is it gonna sell, is it gonna sell, is it gonna be successful, is it gonna wipe its feet, as the expression goes, commercially. I don't care, mm. I don't have to care. So that gives me the self-indulgence. It gives me the right to self-indulgence when I make music. I, I just kind of make music. Again, I'm not making music just for me. I'm very much aware that I want to make records that are going to touch people and blow people away. But I don't want to make them just to please the expectations of those people. I want to make them to please the expectations of them but also me. And that means I have to do something that excites me, that motivates me to go to the studio every day. And that means not the same shit I was doing 20 years ago or five years ago. Mm. Do you ever go through this cycle? Because um, I've just finished my 19th book. Um, wow. And Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and I go through this process of, and this is, I used to be an artist as well for a few years before I made it as an entrepreneur. And I tend to go through this cycle of, 
<laughs> this this piece of work I'm doing is really good. This is a this is a disruptive art form. My current book is Money Matrix. That's the, the title. And then I look back on it a year or two later, and I, I'm relatively disgusted with my with the work. So I like I've gone through the every single book I've written. I'm like I'm really enjoying writing this book. This is a groundbreaking book. Um, and then I look back on it, and I'm like, ugh. The earlier books that you wrote? Every, every, Everything. It, it's a cycle. I did, I did it with all of my art when I was an artist. I, I look at, you know, my style of writing. Or, 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 yeah. I got so, you, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That everything you... And also, what I bet you have... I mean, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing you have fans of your books and what you do that will always say... He's never done anything as good as that book he wrote 20 years ago. Yeah, Money and Life Leverage are the yeah. two. So yeah. that's your in absentius. Yeah. That's your in absentia. Or in some of your fans, that becomes what yeah. in absentia is to you with me. You have fans who always think those two books... See, I, e I even feel dirty and disrespectful to, you know, the hundreds of thousands of people who've bought my books to say I look back on that book and think, ugh. So you know what I'm talking about. And I don't look back on an absentia. Why do you think we're doing a second round? <laughs> <laughs> I don't look back on no, an absentia yeah. and go, Egh. in fact, I'm very proud of that yeah. record. It's one of the best records I've ever made. But at the same time, um, I think all the rec I've made lots of records since then that I would consider to just be on the same level. And it frustrates me if other people don't see it that way too. So again, we're back to that whole weird kind of contract that you have, your fans, a relationship that you have with your fans. Um, so you understand what I'm talking about. Any, anybody that has a continuum of work has to deal with this phenomenon of there will always be something in your back catalogue for whatever reason, and you don't quite understand why yourself often, is the one the one that seemed to resonate with the most people and you don't quite know why and you're actually on a kick into nothing if you try to re recreate it and you're on a kick into nothing if you don't try to recreate it and you okay. almost just have yeah. to accept it. So when I wrote probably my most, I would say probably my best book, it, it's called Money, No More, Make More, Give More. And after that, I wanted to express myself a bit more freely on my creative journey. Because I think being an entrepreneur is just more than making money. It's about overcoming procrastination. Sure. Yeah. So I wrote, start now, get perfect later. And it's about valuing yourself. So I wrote, I'm worth more. Um, and it's about taking opportunity. So I wrote, opportunity. Because I felt like it's not just about money and commercialism. It's about all these things. I've been an entrepreneur nearly 20 years. And now I'm like, damn, if I'd have written seven money books, I, I, forget Robert Kiyosaki, everyone will be talking about me. I'd be the money guy. Mm. So now I'm planning to write a series of money books. But are you doing that because you think that's what the market will respond to best or because you have a passion to write about that subject again? If you're just doing it because you're thinking, oh, nobody wants these other books, I better go back to doing that shit I was doing at the beginning. Because this is the whole conversation again, back to in absentia, uh, you wanting in absentia. Are you doing it because you feel like you have more to say on that subject? I, I, I'm, I mean, there's never enough to say about money, I guess, is there anyway, but... but no, and that's one of the reasons why yeah. I want to write a series, not just a book, because I right. think it's a subject that needs a series, not a book. And the whole... Co and, and it's constantly changing anyway, isn't it? It is. As a topic, it's constantly changing, yeah. And, and I haven't yeah. written a money book since 2018, and think of the world post-COVID, post-lockdown, yes. high inflation, yeah. etc. Yeah. Do I want to write a book that has a big market and sells to a load of people? I absolutely do. Um, yeah, but so do I. I want to make a record that mm. sells and, and reaches a huge amount of people too, yes. But the, I suppose the question is always, which is, the, which is the fundamental here, is at what personal cost? And if you are the kind of person that feels somehow, you, you mentioned that you feel dirty. If, you, if I felt dirty just doing something... I didn't. I loved it at the time. It's looking yeah. back. I think it's, I think it's something that I don't like about 
looking back at... But that's different. Yeah, you're, you're looking back, you feel dirty because you feel like you could do it so much better Yes, it, yeah, I look at that. I look at certain styles of writing or yeah. way, ways I quote or reference yes. and I'm just a bit like, oh, that's just a bit... Whereas My I style think, is so much more. Whereas I think, if I, I think if I made a record now that sounded like one of my old records, I would feel dirty because I was trying to recapture something that wasn't necessarily what my natural art, artistic intentions would have me do, but because it had been the most successful. Mm. And you know, and you see this time and time again in the music industry, think of all the artists that have ended up essentially, after years and years and years and years of trying to do different things, ended up making Bat Out of Hell Part 2, or Tubular Bells Part 3. Mm -hmm. It's happened a lot in the music industry. Those artists, the Meat Loafs and the Mike Holfields, they've tried to make other records, they've tried to get away from this brand that's been so massive for them. So massive. That in a sense it's overshadowed everything else they've ever, they've ever tried to do, and so they've ultimately come back and well, fuck you then. If that's all you want, <laughs> yeah. I'm just. And you, that's why we ended up with Tubular Bells Part Two, 20 years after Tubular Bells, and then he made Tubular Bells Part Three, and then he made the Millennium Bell, yeah, and then Bat Out of Hell Part Two, and Bat Out of Hell Part Three. It's sad in a way. Part of it is sad that after trying to move on. These artists work, they did get to the point where they said, well, sod it then, I'm just going to make part two of that thing that you all loved, I, might, mm. I did 30 years ago. It's almost like I've th I'm throwing in the towel, I'm just, I'm just going to acknowledge that you didn't really want... It's ha it happens in the movie industry too, of course it does, mm. doesn't it? You know, yeah. um, you know in, at the end of the day, directors go back and make train spotting part two or whatever it is, you know. And the, 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 the reality... How, how do you know if it's success unless you scratch the itch, though? Well, but you know... Well, the answer to your question is you know, by, by, you know from the results that mm. none of these sequels, none of them, were ever as iconic or successful as the original. And that's not to say that they weren't successful. Mm, yeah. Bat Hell Part 2 was massive. Yeah, that, just wasn't Part 1. That bloody, you know, I could, I'll do anything for love, but I won't do that, was massive. Yeah. But the bottom line is, Bat Out of Hell is still the album that continues to sell thousands of copies every month, whereas Bat Out of Hell Part 2 is largely a forgotten part of his, his catalogue. Yeah. The same with Tubular Bells Part 2. So, I don't know. Um, Train Spotting Part 2 is never, it was successful, but it's never going to replace. Train Spotting will always be the iconic movie. Will always be. Mm. It's the commercial world that pushes you towards making the sequel, not the artistic intention, I think. Right. And um, something I'm addressing currently in my, um, in Money Matrix is the paradox of business and art. So yeah. Andy Warhol says that being good in business is the most fascinating kind of art. So how do you balance the creative and the commercial? And is there a way to see the commercial as creative? So I'll give you an example. Do you remember when Radiohead launched their album where you could choose how much you paid? I think it was a bit of a fuck you to the label because I yeah. think they'd moved on from the label and now yeah. they're like, we're free. Yeah. And I just looked at that and thought, that's really creative. And I think they did well commercially out of it. I think that there was a, you'd have to do your research, anyone listening, but I'm pretty sure the average person paid about the same as they would have for a CD or a no, I can vinyl. No, I can tell oh. you, I can tell you oh, because okay. I know 90% of people paid nothing. 90% of people paid nothing. That, dis that disgusts me as a fan. Yeah, me too. And no one ever did it again, did they? <laughs> <laughs> and there's a reason no one ever did it again. Because it fucking didn't work. 90% of people paid nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And this is part of the problem. Right. That okay. this how, how, did you, how do you know that? Because I'm, I'm in the music industry, yeah. Robert. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. Give me a bit more. Oh, come on. I speak to people that know. I, speak, I spoke to people that worked on the campaign. You know, right. I know. So I put like 
25 quid when I didn't have a lot of money into that when I could have got the CD for a quid. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. <laughs> 90% of people had no conscience about it at all. And I think that's the problem, is that we are now in an era where music is free. It shouldn't be, but no. it is. We're, we're, we're now... Well, it's your version of intellectual property, isn't it? Well, well, we're living in a world... Well, that's a whole other world. We should, we should, we should talk about that. Okay. AI. We should talk about AI now mm. and how that's going to affect music, because that's going to completely shake it up again. Right. We are, okay. we are in a, we're in a generation now that have grown up in a world where music is free. You don't pay for music. You don't pay for music. Why would I pay for music? Now we're in a world that's about to transition again where music might not even be made by human beings. It might become, I'm not talking about all music, but gen generic forms of music, techno music. It's very easy to program AI to make generic tech techno music. So why would anybody pay anybody, to, a human being, to make techno music? We're not a million miles away. In fact, I think this is going to ha happen in the next, probably the next five years. We're not a million miles away from you being able to come home from your busy day at the office and say to your computer, your Alexa, or whatever the equivalent is, Alexa, please, I would like a piece of music in the style of Porcupine Trees in Absentia or Opus Blackwater Park but I want it sung by Freddie Mercury and I want it to be about, I want it to be a happy song about moving to Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> and the AI will create that for you in real time. It will be a bespoke piece of music just for you that's created in real time with, a, with an artificial uh, model of Freddie's voice but sounding like a very convincing outtake from Blackwater Park or In Absentia, and the lyrics will be a joyous song about moving to Mexico. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. And the only thing the business has to talk about is who gets paid for that. Do the estate of Freddie Mercury get paid for that? Does the estate of Opeth or Pookie Pantry get paid for that? And this is a whole can of worms opening up now in the music industry about who gets paid for what, because they know it's coming. They know it's coming. Artificial intelligence can already create convincing impersonations of Beatles songs from the 1960s. There's been online famously recently, there's been songs that were recorded by Paul McCartney solo. Someone's taken them and created a version where John Lennon sings it. Very convincing. Almost like it was a Beatles song that John sang, that Paul had written for John. This is going to happen, and it's not far off. And part of me thinks we're in the end of days anyway for, for the music industry, which is a very sad thing to acknowledge, and I'm very fortunate. I feel like I've lived through the last great era, in a way, for creativity and music and human beings making music with all its flaws and all its personality traits, because we're entering a time now where it's very easy for AI to make a convincing Drake song because Drake puts his voice through 100% auto-tune anyway so it already sounds like Stephen Hawking is on lead vocals <laughs> how hard <laughs> right so how hard is it for an AI to create a convincing Drake impersonation not very hard because it already sounds like a robot singing so this whole thing about musicians becoming obsolete this is a whole other area there's a book to be written about this, I tell you. Yeah. Because it's a scary time. And I think everyone doesn't really know. A bit like when streaming was like first, you know, Napster first came on and on board and online and everyone, all the record companies and all the artists, you know, were f like Lars Ulrich famously yeah. got himself in a lot of hot water. Everyone was freaking out. No one could really figure out how it was going to impact them and their livelihood. And the answer is terrible it impacted all musicians terrible but there was no way to put the genie back in the bottle really mm. and how did they evolve was it through more live shows i think the artists that could um move their attention from making records to to going out on tour which is why we increasingly have the legacy tour the greatest mm. hits tour at least people will pay 300 bucks for yeah. a, for to hear 
you know, Elton John go through all his hits because, you know, at the end of the day, there's much less interest in Elton John writing and recording a new record. Mm. Um, but it's true of almost every artist. So that's how the world moved because of, really because of the advent of streaming. Mm. But I mean, that, that also pushed towards people towards a sort of greatest hits culture what we talked about, the, the decreasing attention span. Would you ever do a Greatest Hits? You mean an album or a Greatest Hits tour? Uh, an, an album. Mm, uh, yes, I mean, yes, I would do an album where, where I compiled what people think of as my most popular songs, yeah. Mm. I mean, I think there's something wonderful about the iconic Greatest Hits album. Mm. For some artists, I think that's, that's the definitive, you know, album, the Greatest mm. Hits album. And a tour? No, I would have no interest in just going out and playing what for people perceive of as my most popular songs, mm. no. I'm too bloody minded, yeah. Are there songs now you don't like playing live? Do you sort of, I mean Creep, Radiohead wouldn't play that for years, would they? Do you have that same thing where it's just songs you've just moved on from, you don't want to play them even though the fans want them. Well, for the same reason you were saying, you look back at some of your early books and you're like, ooh, you know, yeah. I could do that so much better now. And it's almost like, it's almost like being forced to go back and look at photographs of yourself in secondary school with the terrible hair and the terrible clothes sense, you know. <laughs> Why would you go out dressed like that now? Uh, you wouldn't. No. I don't think Radio, Radiohead still don't play Creep or the, whatever Tom and Johnny, they would never play the Creep. But it's actually, so ironically, it's other artists go out and play those. That's one of the most covered songs in mm. the last 30 years, isn't it now? Yeah. Prince has covered it, Tears for Fears yes. has covered it. And so it's become one of the most covered. So it's almost like they don't need to play that song now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, because did you, um, in our first interview, you talked about the song you felt was your least favourite because it was the most commercially focused. Could you remind us which one that was? Well, there was a song called Permanating a couple of records ago, which was very, it was my sort of, it was my homage to ABBA and the mm. great pop I grew up with. And of course, I knew it was going to upset my rock fan base and they got really upset about it. But I'm still really proud of that. So maybe that's not the one you're talking about. Um, no, there was one, it was... Um, well, people will have to go and watch the first interview. Well, Trains is a very popular Porcupine Tree song from In Absentia. It's become the most popular Porcupine Tree. I think streaming yeah, figures... You didn't talk about that as one that but you I'm felt was written as the most commercial. You know, songs I've written with a sort of one eye on being commercial. Yeah, yeah, there was one song. I forget the name of it. People, it's all right. People will have to go and listen to the first episode. Yeah, there's a few candidates I can think of. I mean, this is, this is the whole... I mean, this is in a way the whole lie with me is that there have been times when I've when I've tried to court um, mainstream appeal. There have been, in fact, comparatively recently, really, comparatively, you know, the last 10 years of my career I've tried, but it's always been a terrible failure because I think I'm not the kind of person that can do that and not come off as an incredible charlatan. People can see through it. Mm. Um, I think people suspect my... But in a way, I'm happy about that because that, that all comes back to this idea that I think I've earned the right to be someone seen as... I'll always make a record with integrity. So the, the very occasional times that people can sniff that I haven't, I've been a bit compromised, they, they don't like it, and I don't like it either. So um, I'm, not, I'm not good with... I'm not good with trying to, um, I'm just not good, at, I, I just don't lend myself to mainstream appeal. I think I'm better when I'm, I'm, I'm better when I'm being indulgent. Mm. I'm better when I'm, some, some people are like that, you know, some people are like that. And other people can, it just amazes me, other people can just go into a room and come out with a hit. The Bee Gees always astounded me, how the Bee Gees could just go into a room and, two hours later come out with a number one song and it didn't feel it didn't smell of fakery mm. bullshit it was just them it's what they did yeah um they might they might they might have written it for 
Kenny Rogers or Barbara Streisland or themselves or whoever they'd written it for, but they came. The point is, they came out came out of that room with a million song, a, a number one hit. Mm. The Beatles could always do that too, you know. Yeah, it amazes me that talent to be able mm. to do that, or that that ability to connect with Elton John did it repeatedly in the seventies. That ability to be able to connect with a sort of popular mainstream sensibility, I just don't have that, and I've never had that. No. Most people don't. Was it Dead Wing? Was it, was it Dead Wing? Oh, Shallow! Yes, shallow, shallow yeah. yes. Yeah, that was the record company. But I like that song. I do too. I do too. I don't, well, I don't dislike it, but there was definitely an element of let's write something that can get on MTV between Creed, Bush, all the stuff that was big at the time. Yeah. Creed and Bush and, and um, you know, the whole sort of arse end of new metal. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's do something that can get played. And that was Porcupine Tree's version of, of that, yeah. Mm. So that, yeah, that was a moment when I think I allowed a little bit of that commercially minded thought process to, to interfere with the creative process. And it was, I don't mind that song, but let's just say we haven't played it live since the first tour of 2005. We never played it again. No. It wasn't, it wasn't something we felt particularly invested in as a song. Certainly not in the way that we were invested in some of the other songs on the record. Mm. So, you said earlier that you, um, after In Absentia, you, they, um, the, the, you got dropped by the record company. Can you talk about that? No, we got dropped after Dead Wing. So Dead, right, this, yeah, this, the album after, yeah. So we, we were under a I lot more... I fucking love Dead Wing as an album. Me too. I would even say that's better than In Absentia. Well, I like the album, but let's just say that we were, we, we were under a lot more pressure with Dead Wing. We had a smaller budget because In Absentia had been considered a terrible commercial failure. We made Dead Wing on a smaller budget. We were under more pressure to come up with a song like Shallow which I thought we'd had on the first album, Blackest Eyes, I thought could have been. Anyway, mm-hmm. Shallow felt like a slightly more, dare I say, shallower song. Anyway, um, we made that record and it was similarly not really, it didn't do anything more than an absentia had done, so we got dropped. So we got the second shot, but, but the second shot was like on a much lower sense of investment from the record company, both financially and emotionally they weren't as invested in it at all and we could feel that so we yeah. knew, knew what was coming and how did the career evolve moving on beyond being dropped because what is there do you end up with a sense of more freedom now that you've been dropped and you can move on from the commercial restraints do you have a bit more freedom now we had a much more pleasant time. We moved to Roadrunner, which was a more metal well, or- yeah, yeah. yeah, a metal mm. orientated label. And we liked the people more. We felt more at home. We weren't competing with the label, for, you know, for trying to get their attention on us rather than on Kid Rock or Matchbox 20, which was always the problem we had at where we were with you know, um, La, um, the label we were on in the US, Warners, for, for um, In Absentia and Deadwing. We were suddenly on a label where we felt more at home, we felt that people understood the music more. We, made, we continued to make two, two more records we made. Which um, ones were they? Fear of a Blank Planet, and, which is a great record. I love that yeah, album. One of my favourite yeah. records I've made. And then The Incident, which I don't love. I think it was the, the sound of the band beginning to run on empty. And we stopped. What was, what, sorry, which one you uh, thought the ran incident. on? The Incident. Oh. The Incident was the last one. And then we stopped. That's one of the, sorry to yeah. jump in. That, the Incident is an album that has a lot of songs that grow on you, mm. especially through the sort of, what, the, the middle to back end, discovering songs. I think um, it's a good record. I don't feel it's anywhere near as good as In Absentia, Dead Wing or Fear of a Blank Planet. To me, it was the sound of, and I speak for myself here, although I know the other guys feel the same. To me, it was the beginning of me just being bored with the metal vocabulary. Right. How many songs can you really write with the, the metal guitar sound and the clicky bass drum and the... I kind of felt like, been there, done that, now I want to do something else. And I can hear that when I hear the record, I can hear that I'm slightly struggling to... Which is why we stopped at that point. And you know? what was your first solo album? Insurgentes, which was a Mexican word meaning insurgents. And yes. that was a completely different kind of record. That was almost like a shoegazer... 
uh, I was I was sort of inspired by a lot of the sort of post punk music I'd grown up with, and it was a completely different thing. Um, yeah. Quite a discography you you feel well, you're is. building. Yeah. 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 I think that's the thing. I look back at all these records, and I see it as a oeuvre. You look at this body of work as a continuum of, of music or whatever, of art, and fans can have different points in that continuum that they like better mm. than the other parts. But if you're an interesting enough artist, they'll still go with you on this journey where they know some things are going to appeal more than others, but they respect your right to make the album that they didn't really like. Mm. They respect your right to do something that didn't perhaps resonate with them as well as the previous album, or, and this is the key, or the next album. Mm. So I didn't like that one, but you know what? Give one, next one a go. I'm definitely, yeah. I respect his rights have made it, and I respect the fact that he's gonna do something different again with the next one, mm. and, I respect, and I respect, I have enough respect that I'm gonna to listen to it. Mm. And this is where the, the conversation comes about, again, the Slayer thing or the ACDC thing, at which point do you stop and never return? Because you know, essentially, that they are never gonna do anything different. Mm. And I'd rather, so I'd, I guess I'd rather be, with all the pitfalls and all the problems that they have, that it has as a, as a career approach, I'd rather be that first artist that kind of keeps disappointing their fans because they didn't do the same or they didn't do what they expected but at least the fan has enough knowledge about you and faith in you to know that the next thing might recapture their, their love mm. of you. And seeing as you open the Pandora's box of AI, mm. uh, I've got on here um, to ask you about the future of music and someone wanting to come into the, um, be a musician now, being how different it is from when you started, let's bring those together. How does a musician get paid fairly? Um, and how, what is the, the new musician with AI? These are really good questions and I don't have any answers. I'm asking myself these questions all the time at the moment. It, it does feel like one of those moments when everything is, is about to change, probably for the worse in terms of making a livelihood from music. Um, I don't quite know how musicians will fit into this brave new world, except I still think there will always be a place for, and this comes back to our conversation about making music which exists outside of genre. AI will find it relatively easy to create generic music. It will find it much harder to create music that somehow thinks outside of the box and does the unexpected. So to me, that's where you'd be better placed as someone who's created their own kind of sound. Although again, AI can probably analyze anything and eventually come up with an impersonation of it. But if you're always moving, it's harder, isn't it? It's a moving mm. target. Mm. It's a moving target. Well, I'm like that today, but I'm gonna be like this tomorrow. Copy that, you fucker. <laughs> yeah. But now I'm over here. You, get, you didn't get that bit, did you? So <laughs> I think, you know, that sense of being an artist that's constantly changing is going to be harder for AI to... But, you know, it's all, we're already at a point where I think generic music is... You is, could probably do that better than anyone, couldn't you? It's very easy to, to... I think already, like I said to you, generic club music or house music is almost... It's almost at the point where you don't need human beings to make that at all. You don't need... You could make music like that with you, already. I mean, there are software that almost creates it for you. And so the only trick really is going to be incorporating singers into that equation. Having the sound of Aretha Franklin or Beyonce or Freddie Mercury on your song as if it's been sung by that singer in real time for you. That's the bit that I don't quite... I don't quite know how that's going to change things, but surely it must have a negative uh, impact. 
This, the, answer, the answer to your question, Rob, is if, if people ask me, and people do still ask me, what would you say to, to kids who want to get into the music now? I say, do it because you love it. I can't remember if we talked about this on your last, the last episode, but you just have to do it because you love it, uh, which is really the only ever reason you should ever have started in the music industry anyway, because you love making music and you don't care if anybody will listen to it or you'll see yourself reflected back in that mirror at all. Because a lot of people never do now. I mean, Spotify has 120,000 songs added every day. 99% of them never get listened to by more than the person that made it on their mum. And it's true that there is an incredible amount wow, of music yeah. being uploaded so onto the books, internet. The average author sells 20 books. Yeah, exactly. That saddens me. It's as very well. sad. It's yeah. very sad. But in the world of music now, it's the same. There are, you know, that fame, talking about Andy Warhol, that famous Andy Warhol quote. Famous for 15 minutes. Mm. Famous for 15 people is the 21st century version of that. There are, there are artists on Bandcamp that have a dedicated core of 50, 100, 200 people that just buy everything they do, and so, but they're selling directly to them so they can sustain that model. That's the new model. But I still love that magical idea of music being able to change the world mm. and reaching reaching a kind of critical mass. I still love that idea, so I don't give up on that. But a lot of musicians have retreated to that little band camp world. I've got 50 fans. If I upload a song every week just for them and they'll pay a pound for that, you know, that, that can, well, that's, that's not gonna sustain you, is it? Okay, let, let's, say, <laughs> let's say if I make an album every month and I charge them 10 pounds for it and there's 200 people that will download it, it's two grand a month, I can just about sustain a career as a music, music musician in that way. There's a lot of people doing that. Some of them are my friends, so I know. Mm. But that is a bit tragic to me, because uh, some of these musicians are amazing and they write great songs that I think are really accessible and in another alternate reality should be massive pop songs. Mm. But they're not. No. Famous for 15 people. Right. That's that's the new twist on the Warhol thing, I think, for me. Mm. Yeah. We. This is probably only our second conversation about AI. Would you say on the show we had the, the ex CAI chap? That was fascinating. But I've, this is the first time on our show I've thought about the um, the world of art, the arts and AI. Because initially you. I was thinking about military and you know use on the on the front line, um, and the uh, when the execution order comes from the first robot if it hasn't already. Mm. But is original art going to die? Well, this is I I think in many ways art is always the first casualty of these things. Um, photography, for example, any you speak to any professional photographer. The problem is anyone with an iPhone now thinks they're a photographer. Why would they employ a photographer, you know, a, a professional photographer? Art is, I think, is always one of the first casualties. The world of cinema or TV, you think, do you think the fact that some of these great actors of our generation, you know, the Harrison Fords, who famously has just been a, a youthful version of himself, has mm. been in the last movie, do you think the fact that when Harrison Ford or Tom Hanks pass away, there's not going to be any more Harrison Ford or Tom Hanks movies? Of course there is. Wasn't this, did you watch the Black Mirror episode where this paradox was? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. The first uh, one of the new season, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and have, have these, have the rights been signed over yet? Or is this back to the question it's of where happen. does the money go? Well, exactly. If Tom Hanks sells a likeness of himself to a studio, um, you should do it when he's 95. Can he do that? Or, or, yeah, or do, yeah. do the studio have to? I think they would probably have to in that yeah. case. I think th there are lots of conversations here um, about, you know, likeness. But these, these things have always existed in the world, you know. I mean, like Tom Waits famously sued a commercial. Um, I think it was a commercial for a beer or something where they had, this is going back 30, 40 years now, where they had completely appropriated his whole style and sound. It wasn't a Tom Waits song, but anybody that listening to it would be forgiven for thinking it was a, an unreleased Tom Waits song. 
but it was an original song mm. melodically it wasn't him singing the chords the melody weren't his melodies or but it, they clearly appropriated everything about Tom Waits in order to give people the idea this was a Tom Waits song and he sued them I think successfully but where does that end because Tom Waits himself there was a lot that you could say, well, he sounded a lot like Louis Armstrong or Howlin' Wolf or these old blues singers. There's ne nothing ever comes from a vacuum. There's always precedence. So I don't know, likeness. If you take Tom Waits and you change his face just enough that it's not Tom Waits, but that people might be forgiven for thinking it's Tom Waits. Uh, sorry, Tom Hanks. People might be forgiven for thinking it's Tom Hanks. I don't know. Black Mirror, always ahead mm. of the game, yeah. Mm. How does this make you feel, this conversation on how the world's changing? Can you see both sides? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Does it make you sad, frustrated? Does being sad and frustrated make you a better, art, better, better artist? All of those things, I think one of the, again, relating this just back to the world of music, one of the really interesting things about music is it keeps changing. The way people make music, the way people relate to music, the way people engage with music, continues to change. Lest we forget, a hundred years ago, this whole world you and I grew up, and we're talking about the world of buying records and getting into albums, didn't exist until about the mid 1960s. Oh, actually, a little bit earlier, Frank Sinatra kind of brought the idea of the concept album in the 50s. It's a relatively new thing, and it's already on the way out. So it had about a 50 or 60 run. 50, 60, 50 or 60 year run, this idea of the album as something that you'd press, if you're a record company, an artist, you'd press tens of thousands of copies, they'd go into record stores, people would go into record stores, buy your album, take it home, put it on the turntable and go on a musical journey. It only existed for about 50, 60 years and it's mm. already kind of disappeared or disappearing. So it's just a blip really, it's a mm. blip that you and I are very attached to because we grew up in this generation. Obviously, the younger generation don't have that attachment to, to the idea of the album as a, as a musical journey or whatever. They don't care. They just like a song. Mm. They don't even care who made the song. If I say to my kids, you really like that song, who's the artist? They don't know. No, no. interest. Couldn't care less. No, no allegiance to the cult of personality at all. Just the song. Right. And I think that's, again, that's all part and parcel of the world, the, the virtual world. It's about songs now. It's not about albums. It's about 30 seconds of a song or 15 seconds on TikTok rather than a whole song. Am I happy about this? Obviously not. Obviously not. Mm. But I'm lucky that I've been doing it for long enough that I, I actually don't, I wouldn't say I don't care, I do care, but it's not going to affect me and my livelihood, mm. which is a shame that, mm. that it's going to affect the livelihoods. Potentially there are so many great artists out there, they're a young would be Tom York's, would be Paul McCartney's, would be Neil Young's, would be David Bowie's, would be Kate Bush's, that will never be allowed to grow, break through and develop and make music. Mm. If you could play a gig for one person, who <laughs> would it be? I think, I think I would say I would love to play a gig for the kid who loves movies, and loves the whole idea of, of going on a cinematic journey but doesn't think that music can have the same effect or follow the sa have the same kind of high aspirations. That's not quite the sort of answer you're expecting, uh, you were wanting, but that's, I mean, yeah, anyone that I think doesn't understand that music can take you on that cinematic journey too. Mm. Um, will Porcupine Tree ever make another album? I don't know. I don't know, and I like the fact I don't know. Um, would you rather have one million new engaged fans or one million cash, and why? Oh, uh, fans, definitely. Uh, I mean, I think anyone who falls in love with being creative and being a musician, you don't fall in love with it because you want to make money. You fall in love with this sort of romantic idea of seeing yourself reflected back through your art in this mirror of having listeners, viewers, whatever it is. And I've never, I've never changed in that perspective. Um, what would you regard as your biggest mistake? 
I think my biggest mistake was not being born 20 years earlier. Because <laughs> I would have probably had a, a much more successful and, and I think it would have been much more possible for me to have reached a, a bigger audience um, 20 years. I mean, I came out in the 90s when it was already becoming tough. Yeah. Mm. And your biggest regret? Not being born 20 years earlier. <laughs> so what was your biggest mistake? <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, regrets, I've had a few to coin a, a phrase. Um, I think the only time I've really regretted anything is when I felt I have compromised myself in any way. But I learned that lesson pretty early on, that I don't feel good about that. Yeah. Um, what's your most brutal life lesson? Um, God, I thought these were going to be what your favourite colour type. Because my br most brutal life lesson. <laughs> I take that as a massive compliment, by the way, what you just said. And I'm you should just do. going to own it. Yeah. My most brutal life lesson, which I think is something I alluded to earlier, which is that it's not a brutal life lesson, but I think it's a, it's a very profound one, is that it is about the journey. It's not about the arrival. And all the wonderful things about life are things that almost happen when you feel like you're on the way to something rather than, it's like making an album. To me, when I look back, the joy was in making the record. I was always disappointed slightly with the final piece, but I had a great time making it. And all my wonderful memories of the moment when a, mel a melody suddenly occurred or a breakthrough in the production or a wow moment, a great guitar solo, oh my God, I've made something really amazing there and it didn't exist five seconds before. Mm. But the actual the outcome, the actual release in the album is always a slightly deflating moment. Mm. So it's, a let it's an important lesson, I think, to enjoy the process. And that applies broadly across you know, life, not just making music. So I'm going to, if you don't mind, just slip one more cheeky yep. one in, just because um, I didn't ask you this the first time round. Okay. Um, what is your creative process? You know, do you have a very defined way in which you write and make music? Do you need the deadline for accountability? Do you go through procrastination and highs and lows on the journey, etc.? Yeah, all of those things. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I have a strong work ethic. I go to the coalface every day and I chip away. I mean, I'm not, you hear these stories about, oh, Bob Dylan goes into a, a hotel room and comes out with an amazing song, or Paul McCartney wakes up in the, the, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night and yesterday just miraculously comes into his mind and he writes it down. And I'm not that person. I don't create music unless I apply myself to doing it. I go to the studio, I chip away at the coalface, and weeks go by when I produce nothing but shit. And then one day, after three weeks or four weeks, a little chip in the wall appears, and I, okay, I've got something now, and I keep chipping away at it, and suddenly there's a hole, and then the whole wall crumbles, and you have a breakthrough. And that metaphor for me is really the point, that I, Every day I have a sort of nine to five thing where I go to the studio, I work, I try to find something that excites me and makes me want to build on it. And sometimes those things are really hard to come by, really hard to come by. I, mean, I don't know about you, maybe it's trying to find the subject that you know can be a book. Those things don't come easily. And it's almost the same thing. You're looking for a subject that, that you know can grow into a book. You're looking for a little musical, something that excites you enough that you know you can build on it. And in a world where there's already way too much music, trying to find that little thing that is a seed that you feel excited enough about to want to give another piece of music to the world, which God knows doesn't need any more music. It's hard. So that's my creative process, bashing my head against the wall. Which is why I said to you that for me it's understanding that it's about the journey. Because mm. the moment you do get that little breakthrough is the best moment of all. So if the world doesn't need more music, why are you making more music? B 
because it's all I can do, it's what I'm good at, and because I still have this rather naive belief that music can still be profoundly moving and magical. Mm. Even though there's probably, as I, at the same time, I acknowledge to myself, there's probably already enough music out there. Mm. It's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the concept of your current album and um, sell it to us. You know, what's different about it? Um, because I remember you said to me when we had the last interview that you were going to do things a bit different with this album and the way that you were going to release it and promote it. Yeah, so the main difference this time is, well, firstly, there are differences musically. It's, it, as we talked about, it's, it's, the mu it's a music which, for me, had no agenda in the sense that I just wanted to make a record that existed outside of any genre, could go in all sorts of different places at a moment's notice, and feel like a real kind of unexpected journey, and that's the album I've made. Um, in terms of the way I'm releasing it, I mean, I am trying to think about the era that I'm making music in. We're keeping the pre-rollout campaign very short this time, for only four weeks from announcement of record to release, and that's a big difference. It's been six months, nine months, and I understand now that we live in a world where, generally speaking, you have people's attention for a very short amount of time. I think in the music world, if you, I see this all the time, out people announce their new record, they release a new video and a new song, and I feel like you have people's attention for about 48 hours if you're lucky. Wow. Yeah, and then they've moved on to the next thing. Radiohead mm. announced their new album, Tool announced their new album, Coldplay announced their new album, Beyonce announces their new album. They're no longer interested in the fact that Steve Wilson announced his new album two days ago. Mm. So my whole philosophy is keep the, keep the campaign short and very, very full. So we're releasing four songs, four weeks in a row, with great videos, with remixes by various artists. Keep the content really strong, keep it very full, and then drop the album after about four weeks. If it was up to me, I would have just dropped the album at a day's notice, but the record company are like, no, quite rightly, they said, no, you've still got fans that need time to mm. discover that you're making a new album. And you, just, you're not Beyonce, you don't have the world looking in your direction, which is mm. fair enough. This show is called Disruptors. What does disruptive mean to you? Did it change since you last came on the show? I don't know, it's changed, but I mean, you know, the, the way I interpret disruptor is someone that um, goes against the grain a little bit. Uh, who, who's a square peg trying to fit into a circular hole. That's my career. That is my career. I'm very flattered that you recognised it, you know, because it is a good thing. I've always thought it was a good thing. I've always thought those are the people that move things on. Um, and in my own little way, I feel like I do change perceptions, even if it's in just in the little community of people that listen to progressive rock, change perceptions of what someone that makes progressive rock can do. Um, so, yeah, disruptor for me, it's someone who shakes things up a bit. What's your interpretation of it? Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that the only interpretation of it? I don't know, maybe not. Mover shaker, game changer, game change changer. maker. Yeah. Yeah, someone yeah. who's prepared to take a risk. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe even... Risk failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah risk failure. Ridicule. Yeah. Tick all those boxes. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm really grateful for you spending a couple of hours here again, Stephen. Thank you for having me back. Yeah. And just remind everyone the name of the album is? So the album is called The Harmony Codex. Yeah. Do you have any preferred place where you want people to listen to it with maybe the best audio quality? Well, it's going to be released on... Atmos, in, on, on streaming platforms that, that have Atmos. It's certainly going to be released in Atmos. Um, it's a good way to hear it. It's a yeah. more three-dimensional way to hear it. Obviously, I'd prefer people listen to it in whatever high-resolution audio format they prefer mm. rather than compressed. It's an album which, let's just say, aspires to a certain level of sonic excellence. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Stephen. Cheers, man. Thank you.
Before you leave, did you watch part one where I interviewed Stephen Wilson and it blew up on the internet? Go check it out. Oh.